You're watching Let's Talk Geek. I am the Staff Rider, and this is episode 66. We're building our own telcos. We're at iWeek, keeping our ISPs alive, and I have awesome glasses.com forward slash net. Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, uh, episode 66. We're coming here live from iWeek, which is why it looks very different to the usual studio. A um, bit more basic, and you can see all the tables behind us. Uh, with us this week, we have Steve Song. Hi there. Uh, we'll go into a bit more detail who he is and, and all the things he's doing. It's pretty cool stuff. And we've got our usual Jan from Yellen. Hi there. Uh, straight from my broadband. Yep. Came through the hectic traffic on the old Johannesburg road to get here. Oh yep. my word, what a catastrophe. It can get bad sometimes at this time of day. And apparently we no, ran Tim, did you forget about me? <laughs> <laughs> and mixing in the background, we have Johan. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm used to not being allowed to yeah, name the, the, the mixer. The, the, this, this week, the mixer has a face. Yeah, it's hiding behind the camera tonight. All right. Sorry about that, Johan. Um, this is Tim Hawk, in case anybody was wondering. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll random for this week? Yes. Camper's motto, bottoms up, Mac. Do you want to tell us about it? I'm yes, it's a, it's a palindrome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it reads the same forwards and backwards, sort of. I mean, you, you can forgive some of the punctuation. Um, and uh, the I mentioned a palindrome because 66 is a palindromic number in binary. Oh, okay, cool. That's the random for the week. Um, also, we had a palindrome email this week from uh, for the competition we were running. Oh, excellent. And I think the guys actually prefer you one, which is very cool. But so I'll, I'll it's like a palindrome-themed week. Yes, really. very much. I'm going to mention next week, though, when we're in the studio properly and we have a bit more time. Um, all right, events happening. Obviously, our week this week, it's still going Thursday tomorrow and then Friday. Um, it'll be very cool so far. We've got, we're going to be putting some videos on YouTube later on some tonight and then as the weekend, as I catch up with everything. Then next week is Rage. Uh, we're going to be there Friday and Saturday recording. Um, so, but it's very cool. We were there last year, wandered around. Hopefully, we're going to get some recordings of the games and chat with the organizers and all the rest of it. Um, that's Friday next week. Um, and then my broadband conference, 26th of October. Yep. Um, so, it's going to be streamed live. And yeah, anything you want to mention about that? Uh, not yet. It's still a month away. Um, but you can hit up the website. All the all the speakers and stuff are listed there. Um, yeah, and, and you guys, Let's Talk Network is going to be doing the streaming for us, just like you're doing the streaming for iWeek. So, if, uh, well done, and thank you very much. Yeah, well, cool. No pleasure. Get, getting some of the bugs worked out today, especially like uh, what we, our service provider. <laughs> I'm sure you can work out who it was. <laughs> well, our service disappeared for a couple of hours this morning. We were testing perfectly, and as they started, it disappeared. Yeah. So um, we we will be talking about it later in the show, I think. Um, <laughs> sure. And and we've been very uh, complimentary towards said service provider because we they finally enabled us to host locally. Um, I mean, it's finally affordable. Yes. You know, bandwidth intensive hosting locally. Let's so come back, but at least they SMS me as a, as a client paying customer. But they SMS me to let me know. Listen, we have a failure. We are working on it, sorry, and they let me know while everything's back online. Neat. And I must be honest, I think part of the problem is why they didn't email people or and their website you couldn't go to. Well, you couldn't get to the email servers or the so website. So SMS was <laughs> basically all you had. <laughs> all they had left. Um, if anybody doesn't know who it was, it was MWeb. <laughs> um, but, you know, they came back and I must say we, we found the guys and got some and they got good feedback from them that it was being sorted out and they managed to sort it out quite. Apparently, there's a switch or central core something that may have fallen over, uh, but I do see they're going to be some downtime this evening, obviously to undo or, or finally correctly fix what was broken oh, today. To, to do it properly. We're, we'll get back to this because I've got comments uh, on this, but uh, I think we need to. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead. I just want to bring in Stephen. Absolutely. Hey. Hi, how's it going? Uh, good. Do you want to mention more who you are, what you're involved in? Um, I know there's a couple of projects you're running. Um, I think the main one was African Village, but do you want to? Sure. Um, the, um, I run a social enterprise called Village Telco, which is all about low-cost uh, wireless mesh, uh, voice and internet. And um, we make uh, an open source, open hardware device uh, called a mesh potato, which um, which combines very cool uh, a, um, a low-cost wireless access point with an, an analog telephony adapter. So it's basically 
a wireless mesh network that you can plug an ordinary telephone into, so create a, a telephone network anywhere. Cool. And as far as I understand, if you get two of them, you just pretty much turn them on, and they will automatically start talking to each other. Was that? That's right. You just uh, you just need to program an extension. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the devices program via telephone or okay. or via web interface. So you don't actually need to configure it beyond punching in an extension. Can I can I touch it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, and I was reading up on your website. The concept behind this is the high cost of telephony and lack of telephony in Africa. Um, yeah, it's those two things, really. It's it's uh, um, a, either a lack of access or access, but it's comparatively expensive for the people who use yeah. it. And um, the issue is, it's it's not a technological problem. It's a uh, it's a it's it's largely a regulatory problem because. Um, well, uh, uh, compare the internet service provision industry in South Africa and the telecommunications industry. Very different, yes. Right? One ruthlessly competitive, you know, um, uh, industry with lots of players and lots of sort of jockeying around for position. And another one with three or four players with uh, not a lot of movement and not a lot of, uh, of innovation. Some people may differ. This is my, my perspective. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but the reason for that is one big reason. Um, and that is Spectrum, right? They, they um, uh, in order to compete in the, in the mobile market, you need access to mobile Spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And so with most of the mobile Spectrum having been allocated uh, that works on current phones, getting into the market is virtually impossible. So, you know, I, you know, I might do the same thing if I were in, the, in that uh, lucky position of having, uh, you know, a lot, uh, comparatively quite a lot of spectrum and not much pressure. Mm. And exacerbating the problem, um, you're not allowed to sublet spectrum. That's actually illegal. So you can't, um, and, and, uh, but that's not supported with like a use it or lose it policy, um, which we don't see much of in the mobile space, luckily. You know, people just sitting on spectrum, well, that we know of, mm. just sitting on spectrum to prevent competition. Um, but it's definitely a danger uh, in a regulatory environment like this. Sure, I think uh, the case with uh, Screamer Telecom and uh, and Centec, you know, is a, yeah. is a case in point. Yeah. I mean, Centec weren't using it. Indeed. Um, some of the other things. So that's obviously running. This is op running on the open wireless network, uh, yeah. wireless frequencies. So that's you, you're saying where you can compete and you can utilize that. Um, are these the normal open bands, or do we have other white space? Oh, okay. Th this is just uh, garden variety Wi-Fi technology. So it works in the 2.4 and uh, gigahertz band. Okay. Yeah. Um, TV white spaces, which um, uh, is is uh, is something else. It's uh, it's an opportunity to um, to extend unlicensed use uh, into uh, lower down the frequency range, uh, into the same um, spectrum bands that television use, but do it in a way that's very very low overhead from a, um, a spectrum regulation and management point of view, because you can set it up as secondary use of the spectrum. So while the spectrum is designated for television use. Um, uh, the spectrum that's not in use by television broadcasters, and there's a lot of empty space in, in, in South Africa, can then be serendipitously reused by uh, TV white spaces technology, which is kind of like Wi-Fi, but moved down the spectrum band. And um, uh, there's been a momentum building around this regulation uh, for the last um, uh, four or five years, but things have really come to a head uh, in the last two years, where two years ago the, uh, the uh, U.S. regulator, the FCC, approved TV white spaces uh, spectrum, um, uh, and, uh, and about a month ago they appointed um, uh, database managers for it. Now I should, should explain, it's not quite like Wi-Fi where you know, it's, it's kind of an all-play situation where anyone right, can put right. up stuff. With TV white spaces technology, the compromise they came to with the broadcasters was that they would have a central authenticating database so that if you put up TV white spaces technology, it would need to authenticate and geolocate against a central database. So it gives the regulator more confidence it, that the it, technology is going to work. Was so with the database, was that going to be worldwide with the database? So I, I, I've understood correctly. So no, in the UK, they actually did allocate some of it back into a equivalent uh, frequency. Some got allocated to Wi-Fi as well. Sorry, apparently we've got a bad mic. <laughs> <coughs> 
So uh, Ofcom, uh, the UK regulator, um, announced only a month ago that uh, around the same time uh, as, as the US, that they were they were actually moving forward uh, even faster, it seems, than, okay. than the US with um, uh, TV White Spaces regulation. They're going with the database authentication approach as well. Okay. And um, uh, they've got pilots running um, in Cambridge um, in partnership with Microsoft and, uh, and some uh, UK uh, companies. And I think... Um, uh, one of the, the uh, one of the Scottish Isles as well. They've got a TV white spaces pilots. Uh, in the U.S., um, you've got uh, both Google and Microsoft and uh, companies like Spectrum Bridge running uh, TV white spaces pilots. So the technology, I mean, the regulation is now there in the U.S. and the U.K. and and that's good news because that means manufacturers are going to go full speed ahead in manufacturing this equipment. Pilot technology, the sort of prototype technology, is all available now if people want to run pilots. But in terms of mass market, we're talking about early 2013. So the opportunity for South Africa is to get the regulation in place now, and the minute that stuff comes to market, boy, it is just a massive opportunity for rural rollout and for entrep uh, entrepreneurship in rural rollout. So not not waiting for telecoms to come to you, but you know, but setting yeah. up your own infrastructure. Yeah, just cool. to explain uh, to everybody uh, quickly about the benefits of, of low frequency spectrum um, uh, in, in a rollout like this. Now, a normal Wi-Fi runs on 2.4 gigahertz. And for those who didn't <laughs> take a, a course in uh, signal propagation at university, um, the higher the frequency of a signal the less coverage it basically gives you so now when you go to a lower frequency like this TV, like TV broadcast at um, you get a much larger cell for you know a similar uh, power. Sim similar power yes it's mostly uh, its ability to go through solid objects mm. so the, uh, the the longer wavelengths at the lower frequencies penetrate concrete um, uh, trees, foliage, anything. So, so you you know it, it doesn't get slowed down by vegetation or, or or buildings and that kind of thing. Whereas Wi-Fi, you know, concrete is a pretty solid and obstacle. Trees are. Yeah, no, <laughs> water water is not good for Wi-Fi. So anything that has water. Oh, you're picking up uh, no, double. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I know, I know from yeah. looks you were involved a bit in the uh, Petroleum Wireless Use Group, and I know as soon as summer comes on and all those leaves come out, yeah, yeah. just your signal <laughs> drops immediately. <laughs> There's nothing that absorbs signal like trees, actually. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. At 2.4 megahertz. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so but so if I may, as yeah. you go down in your frequencies, your antenna becomes an issue. Because now your antenna is getting longer. You do, but you could go. You don't actually. I mean, it, it just has. It has to be a multiple of the uh, of mm. the frequency length. So, it, I mean, at that frequency, you, I mean, you're not talking about massive antennas yes, for that. But that's, there are other factors that do complicate when you drop your frequencies. Well, and another factor is you don't get the same uh, um, capacity of throughput. Yes. So uh, the higher you go up in frequency, you know, the more bandwidth. bandwidth you can yeah. pack into it. So there are trade-offs. But what we are talking about with TV white spaces, sorry, that's not a TV white space device, the, uh, uh, is, you know, the, a range of about 10 kilometers with, uh, you know, with, um, you know, sort of five megabits per second. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Mm. Oh, okay, I'm just going to change slightly into some other things. I know with this, I was also reading that with the way you envisioned and the costing is that if somebody sets it up, that could be profitable within six months or something like this in a village. Um. Yeah, that was our goal in manufacturing the technology was that we wanted to make it cheap enough so that, that, that there was a sustainable business model around providing services. And, uh, you know, if I'm honest, we're almost there. This has been our, our first production run um, of, um, uh, of the mesh potato and uh, I'm happy to say we recently acquired um, uh, an investor uh, based in Boston who are helping us work on, on the manufacturing process and actually lowering the... Um, oh, okay. Uh, cool. The manufacturing costs of the, the device. So we'd like to we'd like to get the the price of this device down to around five hundred rand. Yeah. Steve, uh, sorry, <coughs> Steve. I just want to ask. Um, this device is now giving communication between these devices. It's not breaking out to the old traditional telcos. Uh, absolutely, it can. So it, it it'll create a local telephone network, and it doesn't require a server to do that. It can do it completely autonomously. Yes. Uh, however, obviously, you benefit much more if you're connected to both the internet and to the uh, the public switch telephone network. Now, uh, th probably the easiest way for a small operator to do that is to connect to a VoIP provider in South Africa, like Switchtel or one of the you know the, the many other ones that can actually do the kind of breakout and and give you numbers that uh, you can assign to 
to each customer. But I mean, that device on its own won't, won't handle the breakout services. You'll actually add a, a back-end server to actually then handle the breakout services. That's just only giving right. connectivity yeah. between so this, itself. This, this doesn't talk any, any GSM uh, uh, to any GSM devices. You get, need to gateway to those. But if Thank I you. remember, I think you, remember, you guys do have a server that does that. Yeah, it's all IP based though. Yeah. So yeah. it would, you know, um, uh, and you could plug in a, a GSM gateway or uh, that to the server, but probably easier just to go IP avoid, to, avoid to IPs, someone who's, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the 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 saga of VoIP providers and their their uh, desire to achieve interconnects with the mobile operators is is a long and painful one, and and not for the faint of heart, I think. So yeah, I can imagine. So that's just to clarify, so that's a SIP device. Yes. yes. Yeah. Each it's uh, it runs um, an embedded uh, version of uh, of Linux called OpenWRT. Yes. That's and right. each little device uh, each device has a a, a little uh, stripped down version of Asterisk. Okay. So it's a SIP device. So from there, yeah, the, the, the world's your limit. I mean, as soon as you've got a SIP device, you can do anything with it. Yeah. So it can actually work autonomously. Like if you wanted to plug it in as a kind of you know physical VoIP device, it could work that way as well. Beautiful. Um, and does it do Wi-Fi at all? If you know, if you want, uh, it, I know it does mesh networking, which uh, let's say my phone uh, Wi-Fi would yeah. that be able to connect to this, or would you have to alter the configuration before you can do that? No, it's set up uh, so we it, it has one radio, but yeah. uh, but we split the radio into uh, a mesh networking side and then a virtual access point. So and and one of the great things about the uh, the mesh protocol uh, that we use, um, it actually creates a, a seamless Wi-Fi uh, hotspot across the uh, across the mesh potato, so you can actually roam, roam, uh, uh, making a VoIP call uh, across APs. So in other words, you have a SIP client running on your Wi-Fi connected phone, and you can use it wherever there's mesh. That's right. You need to connect to a SIP server, obviously. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. But sure. yes. Oh, very cool. Now, Indeed. I just know with the Androids that all have the native SIP client. Yes. So yeah, so I've used my Android phone to do exactly that, uh, connecting to a SIP server in Germany, to do, and it works very yeah, well. Yeah, and especially, I mean, uh, it was a topic that came up today again, um, and I'm sure uh, Huawei would also love to, to, to continue to, to boast about the story because they actually did very well in, in Kenya uh, with their Adios, the, that uh, cheap Adios Android smartphone, sub-$100 phone. Mm -hmm. So they apparently sold for about $80. Uh, in Kenya and sold 350,000 units. Yeah. Um, so why can't you buy them in South Africa? Uh, the the Adios is around, um, but yeah, that's good. None of the providers are providing it. I yes, th I, think that's, I, I, that's, I couldn't that's find it on reason. Vodacom <laughs> or yeah, MTN. Yeah. With a lot of these things, a lot of people in South Africa, I think, go with whatever the, the provider will, will, will provide and, and, and yeah, in the contract. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a bit too low in for most contract devices. Yes. So... Otherwise, you'd have to be importing it yourself, and then the cost immediately. Ho however, okay. um, uh, guys, uh, a lot of the, the operators do have sort of cheaper retailers that they work through, like PEP, for example. So where you can get a 100 Rand device. Um, li literally, you pay 100 Rand for a phone, and then it's prepaid. Um, th that cheap kind of thing. And, um, and so that would be an ideal, I think, way to, to try and market a device like this is through a, a cheaper retailer rather than through your normal service centers. Mm, mm. Uh, pl you know, places where people go to get budget deals and stuff. And, and I know they do, but I've not seen the Ideos, to be completely honest. I've searched for it. I, I, w I wanted to buy a couple for a, uh, for a prize giveaway, but... Uh, uh, I have actually have given it, but it was given away as a prize at one of the Google events. Yeah, a G-Tug yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of In the South guys. Africa. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Barry Reed pr Probably wanted. sourced from Kenya. <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> yes. No, it might have been. I know the person, one of the people involved actually came yeah. over from Kenya. Um, uh, one of the other questions I want to ask you is the, the regularity, uh, regulations surrounding this. Um, you know, because effectively you are making your own little telco with this. Would, in this country, uh, would you not need to get licenses and stuff to do that? Uh, it depends um, uh, on the on the circumstances in which you're offering services. So, if you are operating as a non-profit, um, you could uh, operate, uh, as I understand it, uh, in a license-exempt manner. Okay. Um, so, or or, um, or possibly also as a cooperative. So, South Africa has great cooperative uh, legislation, mostly designed for uh, um, for uh, farmers. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, a telecommunications cooperative is a great idea, and that would also you know fit within. As long as you're not making a profit, then um, then you you probably uh, qualify for license exemption. Um, if you are you know turning it into a business, then then you have a couple of options. One is to apply for a class license, which mm -hmm. is is not that hard. Um, 
and um, and I think you know if you're below a certain turnover, it's you know the, the this, um, I don't think you pay a license fee. Okay. Um, may I stand corrected on that. But Correct. the other alternative is to is to operate under the aegis of um, of someone else who has uh, one of those licenses as a kind of franchisee, which uh, is another possibility. All right. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I had, I had one question. I don't know if you wanted to move the the topics along, but it's yeah, cool, it's sort of in this it's sort of in this vein. Um, but but on a on a different uh, on a different topic, which is, um, our we 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 also currently looking at spectrum uh, allocations in South Africa in the 2.6 gigahertz and the the 800 megahertz bands, um, which is usually uh, or which is you know sort of earmarked for LTE, and one of the topics that's or one of the options that's come up is sort of a, a wholesale or an open access network. Um, I don't know if you've got an opinion on that um, that that you'd like to share. Is this the uh, solution that was um, um, proposed by um, the CEO of, of Vodacom? Uh, yes, the CEO of Vodacom, and I think um, a lot of the other guys have also chimed in. Um, ATA, ATA has chimed in that they're, they're up for a, a wholesale network. Um, I know Vodacom said specifically open access um, without really giving too many details on what that meant. And then uh, uh, Pinky Mohawley from Telcom um, uh, also agreed with with the proposition, but as like a sort of hybrid model. Uh, she, she suggested that you, you license off some of the spectrum and then you keep some for this open access network. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm all in favor of open access, but I mean, the danger of that sort of thing becoming a yet another kind of closed club between the, the incumbent operators is, uh, is, is not very appealing and, um, and, and one could see how that might happen. I think the, uh, you know, if we've learned anything from, say, you know, the last two years of global events, you know, the financial meltdown or the, you know, or reactor meltdowns, is that when, when huge things fail, when big things fail, you know, the, the cost is massive. It's catastrophic. You, so you can't afford for them to fail. Yeah, they're too big to fail, literally. I mean, mm -hmm. to, I mean it's, a, it's a hackneyed phrase now. But so, you know, what's the lesson from that is design things that, that fail well. Right, design things that, f that you know that, that that don't fail spectacularly. So, you know, giving giving Centec that big chunk of of 2.6 um, gigahertz spectrum. I mean, it failed twice. Right, it failed. You know, once from the point of view of of the rollout not actually delivering on it, but it's failing again now because their holding of that chunk of the 2.6 uh, spectrum has arguably been instrumental in delaying the auction of that of that spectrum because yes. they need to actually re um, uh, migrate. Um, um, uh, Centec to the middle of the band so that uh, FDD LTE can operate on, on either end of the band. So it's, I mean, it's it's catastrophic. So I mean, that's why I think you know um, regulation like television white spaces regulation is so um, is so interesting because it's adaptive. If it's not working, you turn it off. You move around. I mean, so it, you know the, the the cost of failure is, is tiny. So what you know, I think if you were going to employ that kind of strategy. Um, you would want to do it in a way that um, that didn't entrench existing interests and and made sure that that if it wasn't delivering, that you had a mechanism for, uh, you know, for changing things. Yeah. Uh, and and um, the, from my perspective, uh, and I'm going to say it so you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the the TV white spaces sort of offers you um, th that sort of best of both worlds as well. I mean, um, it's already in that n s like neat set of spectrum that's already earmarked for, for LTE, um, that's you know already sort of seen as very valuable spectrum for, for rolling out um, into more geographically uh, dispersed sort of uh, places like South Africa. Mm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it just seems like you can have that and, you know, and not have to still worry about this, the digital migration to happen and then to license off the spectrum fairly, and that's probably going to go to an auction that has to be handled, and they're talking about licensing them together. So it sounds like TV white spaces is something that can happen now, whereas digital migration is something that's going to happen at best 2013, 2015 more likely. That's, I think, the best thing about TV white spaces is that it's, a, it's, a, you know, the, um, it's very easy to implement from a regulatory perspective compared to uh, reallocating or refarming spectrum, um, and the technology is going to be, you know, commercially ready in um, in early 2013 for, you know, for massive rollouts. So it's a big opportunity. Everything moves slowly in spectrum yes. management. I mean, you know, and and that's the thing is when you make a mistake with spectrum allocation, or sorry, with spectrum assignment, 
it's hard to recover from, right? Nobody gives back Spectrum without, you know, and what was the without, example yeah. with the um, GPS? Uh, they had all the GPSs in a certain frequency and then they wanted to re-farm and put, I think it's light wire in America next to it. And the, all the GPS people realized that the GPS was bleeding over slightly and uh, the filters weren't quite as good. Yes. So they, they now had to move light wire, I think, give them a, yeah. a slightly more of a buffer. But GPS has never had to uh, pro properly implement a bandpass filter, and so they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and it's just an example that's something historic, and it's GPS modules from years and years ago. Um, but now how do you change it? You know, everybody in their car has these things, and no, it takes years. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, sorry. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, and then you've, you've got, uh, you know, um, you know, dad and, and granddad maybe who have a, a Garmin from 10 years ago which is exactly this old GPS module. And, and the device still works, they're not going to get rid of it. Well, even squatters rights, even when you, where you don't actually have legitimate title to, to Spectrum, turns out to, to have a big impact. So in the, uh, uh, in the battle uh, over you know, the TV white spaces regulation in the US, one of the biggest lobbies, um, aside from the broadcasters, against TV white spaces uh, Spectrum were the uh, microphone manufacturers. Uh, and true, because yeah. they, they use unlicensed spectrum um, in the TV beds and um, uh, and they were concerned that you know that it was going to interfere and and it, and it turned out to be a, a massive lobby even the churches got behind that because you know churches use a lot of wire, wireless, wireless mics. microphones so uh, so you had sort of prominent uh, um, uh, leaders from the uh, from the uh, Christian community in the U.S. speaking on television white space spectrum, which was kind of odd, but um, but so yeah, yeah it is, it's 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 very once you've given it out, uh, it's very hard to take away. Shows you. Uh, okay, I'm just going to move on a little bit. Um, sure. Uh, Monday was International Talk Like a Pirate Day. I think we have some of the topics from last week still going in here. Um, oh, was it was it mentioned last week? Uh, I know I know Annie helped uh, by uh, placing some topics from the past week in the document just to fill it out. So yeah, okay. um, do you want to talk about Software Freedom Day? Have oh. you spoken about it already? No, we haven't. We can. Um, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get there. I, I had I was busy with a whole bunch of other commitments. Okay. I know uh, your brother and Annie were there. Yeah, so, so um, I, I know they've, they've told me about it, but from the sounds of it, it, it was amazing. And um, they, they got to um, hang out with and chat to guys from House for Hack, LSD, or Linux System Dynamics, who played, who played beautifully on their name. Apparently, they, they're not... Uh, above making jokes about the the drug the acronym, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we acronym. The house hack guys. We're going to get on. Thinking about. Uh, I have to check the calendars within the next okay. two three weeks. That's cool because that means I'm, I'm not going to say much about any of these guys. I'm just going to mention who was there and and who cool. Gareth and, and and he saw. Maybe if we get Gareth on the show another time. I know he's busy with Varsity and stuff. He can talk us through all these guys. But um, So LSD was there. GTUG was there. Uh, Jumping Bean was there. GoToCloud was there. Uh, the Wikimedia SA group was there, which I was um, I was part of the, the founding group there, mm -hmm. so I've got vested interest. Um, but I've since... Um, Got time. busy, yeah. But they've they, they they they're going along nicely. They've got a got a board set up. They're doing stuff. I'm on the mailing That's list and cool. stuff. Um, and e-consultant Drupal guys were there. Um, so uh, and these guys had talks and demonstrations about stuff. Um, uh, I for one would be very interested to to have the house for hack guys on. Yeah, no, and, no, and, uh, no, and you chat to them about what they're doing because it sounds amazing. Well, they've got two things that I know. That were, well, first was the art junior, then they're teaching the people how to use that and doing everything with our Juno board. Yeah. Um, and then also they, they're starting, what's it called? It's basically where you can rent space, but just for a very short period from them. Hackerspace. Hackerspace, yes. They're setting up a hackerspace um, in the house for hack. Um, and that also want to ask them, because I know quite a while ago there were some people trying to set them up and it didn't quite work out. So, But they seem to actually, because they're running their own business there, it, it should be far more successful. But I want to actually ask them about that and see how that's working out because it would be pretty cool to start those things in South Africa and yes. reduce the cost to uh, getting into uh, and get some to get some honest to goodness you know entrepreneurial technological innovation going. Uh, we've got some of it, but I don't think nearly enough no, given the level enough. of development of South Africa in comparison to the rest of the continent. And so what's it's true. I was at uh, I was at Maker Fair Africa in uh, in Nairobi last year, and um, you know it was very little representation from uh, from South Africa when. You know there should be, and uh, and I think I think it's a you know it's one of the most exciting spaces in the world right now is is where sort of you know open software and uh, and sort of hacker and I 
you know, hacker in the original sense of the mm. word, uh, culture actually finds its way over into manifesting things in the real world, mm. you know, mm. and, and of course, you know, the evolution of technology, like 3D printers and, uh, and precision um, um, uh, milling devices that are, you know, that are affordable, um, mean, you know, the, you know, the, the the world is opened up in terms of what you can what you well, can it's create. to give more more power back into the ordinary person's hands, so you don't need the, all this expensive equipment, as, as you're saying, no. to get get out there and start building your own things. Which means that if you have an idea, you can actually start to possibly implement it uh, within a reasonable budget. Well, this was the real insight for us with the mashed potato was that, you know, our, when we first came to the problem, we were thinking, oh, well, you know, what North American or European technology could we, uh, you know, co-opt or adapt to, um, you know, to solve this, this access problem? And it was, it blew my mind to, to you know, we had a, uh, a hardware designer from Australia, um, a manufacturer in uh, Shenzhen, China, a, a small, small company, and, um, and suddenly we had our own global supply chain. You know, so Scary. Yeah, it's uh, it's tip of the iceberg, I think. Mm. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, related to uh, talk like a pirate day, I think more interesting is that the German pirate party actually won a seat in parliament. Very cool. I think I think we should have a pirate party, and I think they deserve a seat in parliament to represent hacker interests all around. I think. I'm just reading heads. They've got nine percent, which is actually very good. Yes, that's very <laughs> impressive. Because a lot of the the, the motors and stuff are quite open and. Yes, there is some dodginess in there, but a lot of the interests, if you actually hear what they're actually on about and stuff, I remember there was one meeting where they were told they wanted to have it private and stuff, and he basically refused. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and they had to, I think, basically open the meeting because he... So the, the ethos of what they're trying to do is actually very yeah, good. Yeah, so it's, it's probably going to push, um, I mean, on you know, net neutrality and, and that sort of things, all, all kinds of things that, that pirates are interested in, but also kinds of things that, that guys who care about freedom and openness are, are interested in. Do you think they... <laughs> do, you, do you think they cut into the green vote at the left or the kind of libertarian vote at the right? This is what concerns me is that is that actually, uh, uh, if, you know, the Pirate Party winning so many votes, what that says about German politics, you know, so not knowing anything about German politics, but are the established parties so bad <laughs> that you would rather or, vote for this or, person or who's never going to win? Hopefully, but incorrectly, they're pulling in a part of the thing that hasn't voted because they felt there was no one who would actually who represented rep their represent them. But Fair this enough. Is somebody, you know, they've got quite a good pub, pub, uh, publicizing uh, instrument in the Pirate Bay. Sure. Um, but I don't know if that's true. But if more likely to be the, the green side, I would generally think. <laughs> well, my, you know, allow me to generalize wildly okay. about Germans. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> my experience of, the, of, of uh, my German friends is that they're very idealistic, you know, okay. and, they, and that they, they embrace, you know, things that they believe to be true. Uh, in in very strong ways, and uh, and so that's uh, I think why the Green Party enjoys such success there, but arguably as well the Pirate Party. Mm. So maybe it doesn't speak negatively about German politics, but in fact positively. Yes. Uh, the, the fact well, that I, the so. I would yeah. say this positive that the fact they got so many votes. Cool, definitely. Yep. Um, and uh, you did see the joke about speaking like a pirate. So where's the torrent? Um, <laughs> speak like a pirate. Eh? Yeah, yeah. No, the, no. The, hit the me. Pirate Bay. Yes. Where's my torrent? You know, I'm downloading this really fast. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Took you a tiny while. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. I, I'm going to blame jet lag. I'm still jet lag. I'm blaming the shit. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed it. Um, also, you, okay, you added this NASA's Kepler mission uh, discovers a world orbiting two stars. Yeah, I added this. John McBride from an said actually passed this along. Um, it's a very long, it's a NASA press release, so it's very long. But very interesting is, the star has got two suns, and they actually did a graph of, of showing you how these two suns would actually eclipse, and how the temperature on this planet would go up and down. But mm. yes, there's a there's a planet being discovered at orbiting two suns. Yeah. So, uh, what's a Tatooine? Tatooine. Yeah. No, no yeah. that had two moons. Oh. Okay. You're talking about Star Wars. Yes. Yeah, uh, because there was a big deal on, on the internet about this, because they're like, oh, they finally discovered some insert Star Wars planet here. I'm sure it was Tatooine. Anyway, well, you're unlike Star Wars tattooing, blue, blue, blue ray now. but th there are there are plenty, and I, and I saw some cowboy space cowboy show as well with a planet with two suns. I think you there obviously missed the next topic. Y yes, Star Wars with some <laughs> blue ray. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Let's talk about that then. <laughs> Since you have your wrong uh, geek trivia, 
Uh, yeah, Star Wars eventually got released on Blu-ray this week. So now you can watch your epic uh, six movies in Blu-ray quality. All but you have to answer the very important question about these Blu-rays. Is it original or is it remastered? Remastered, remastered. and so George Lucas words, have made changes. Guido, Gribo, whatever his name is, shot, shot first yeah, uh, on these. Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, no, money. Bear in mind that, <laughs> that most of these changes was done by George Lucas. I don't he care. Feels this is how the story should be interpreted. George Lucas also made the new Indiana Jones movie, and that Which sucked. Yeah, that was not <laughs> good point. That's good. And uh, that killed the whole so conversation. Yeah, it did. <laughs> also, George uh, Lucas tends to do I've that. I've just seen at Kalahari for 749. Right? Yeah, it's actually not bad for such a massive box set. Hey? Mm. Well, they're talking about 30 hours of in-depth bonus supplement. Where are we going to find 30 hours to watch? The problem it? I have with this is all the guys who are going to buy this, right? Which we have the original. Then they got the first... Remastered. And don't forget the stuff that they taped off Mnet yes. back in the day right. when they were kids. Then they must probably no, you never recorded stuff off Mnet. Was this on VHS? <laughs> Do you still have that? <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> I don't have a VHS <laughs> player. the way you were saying that. <laughs> and then they've bought the, there was that second remaster. And now now it's... So there must be at least have four copies of this. So, uh, quick poll. Do you guys have Blu-ray players? No. I've got a PlayStation 3. No. no, I haven't seen the point because I, I, mean, I, I have a very strong feeling within a very short period they're going to be gone and it's going to be hard drives or something similar. Well, so or streaming. my, yeah, my, yes. my, yeah. uh, my consolation is that as long as I buy Sony's consoles, which uh, the only reason I got a PlayStation, by the way, is because it was ridiculously cheap. I got on a massive special, like 90% off kind oh. of thing. Um, and, uh, and so Sony will continue to push their standards. Yeah. So in the next Sony PlayStation... Um, it'll it'll hopefully be backwards compatible with Blu-ray. That, all, that worked out really well for them pushing their memory stick standard. Yeah, and uh, which they've now abandoned apparently. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that yeah, that was sarcastic. Dio stick. You're having a, a good good day t oh, <laughs> today. Um, I'm, I'm having a, my sarcasm detector is look, failing. Put, put this way: if you happen to get the Blu-ray because you bought the PlayStation, you could get the games. You're not actually buying it to get a, a Blu-ray. You're getting it to get the PlayStation. For what? very long, the PlayStation 3 was the best value for money in getting a Blu-ray player. And just getting a, yeah. a, a yeah. home entertainment hub, really. Yes. So uh, it's still the software that they develop, keep on developing. Uh, it's a great media streaming device yeah. um, and a Blu-ray player. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the PS3. That's no, 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 no that's But I'm saying, would you have gone out and bought a Blu-ray if you hadn't done that? No. No. That's the bottom line. But I did buy Blu-rays um, simply Jason. because I wanted... Uh, yeah, but they were also on special. So let's <laughs> <laughs> qualify this. Um, yeah, no, you're cheap. But <laughs> when it comes to buying Blu-ray, 300 Rand for a movie just does not sit well with me. Um, and, but I wanted Braveheart and I wanted movies like Fight Club and I want The Matrix. When anybody sees a special on The Matrix, please holler. Um, I want that in 1080p. That's just how it is. Yes, that's... With <coughs> all the awesome commentary. Well, what's it saying? Pity they didn't make two, two and three, hey? Yeah, exactly. It's a pity there were no sequels to The Matrix. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, um, what are the to other topics here? I see the South African government starting to want to look for a Mark Zuck Zuck Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg, sorry. Struggle with that name. Um, basically, they want to look for young entrepreneurs in this country. It's Mark funny to me how Mark Zuckerberg is the poster <coughs> child for the entrepreneur. Yes. Right? <laughs> Post your child for greed. <laughs> <laughs> but also a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of these guys who've done really well normally have done it without governmental help. And and um, Hawkeys or Gerrit um, tweeted something very cool today in that regard. Mm. Um, this is very political and I know we steer clear of it, so I'm not going <laughs> to mention why he tweeted it. But it was a quote. Uh, from which is which is often misattributed to to Abraham Lincoln. I don't remember who it was now. I'd have to look it up, and we can put it in the show notes later. Um, but basically, the 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 last part of that is that you should not give to a man what he should be doing for himself, um, or he will, you know. Ba basically, the the concept of give a man a fish and he'll eat. You teach a man to fish, and you know he'll eat for the rest of his life. Yeah, I agree. Uh, to my main concern with this is it's you're going to be targeting one or two people so you're putting a very high risk you know if they succeed great you've helped them out but if if that one person fails it's 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 quite a large failure instead of taking that energy and that work and rather putting things in in 
doing things for mass to allow large mm. amount of people to have those so make you know business rules easier for innovators yeah and uh, you you must have a better well, no, understanding so of this I, I think you know um there are certain places where government has to intervene mm. i mean and you know um telecommunications regulation is is an yeah. interesting space because it's a place where they should get out of but get in in certain <laughs> places right so it's not it's not good or bad it's just yes here not so much here mm. and um when it comes to business and, and, and supporting entrepreneurship, I think getting out of the way is by far and away the, the, um, um, the best thing they can do in yeah. terms of lowering the barriers to setting up your own business, making it easier to, you yeah. know, to, uh, to, to handle the administration of, uh, of, a, of a small business. You know, maybe some incentives for small businesses, you know, that, uh, but, but just basically, you know, the, the World Bank do a, a global report called Doing Business, and it, and it goes through a checklist of things, you know, how long does it take you to set up a business? You know, if it takes you six months to set up a business. Yes. And actually, South, South Africa doesn't score too badly on, that, on mm. that chart, but there's lots more that can be done. The other thing, of course, is broadband. Yeah, yes. I because mean, you know broadband, yes. broadband, cheap broadband for everybody. Yeah, you know, and I mean, if if you look at, I, I know it's it's pop culture. Okay, so so two things. First, I wanted to say, um, uh, absolutely, I agree. Getting and getting out of the way. Just reading between the lines of, of what you just said there, getting out the way does not mean doing nothing. It mm -hmm. it it in fact is as much effort as being interventionist because you you have to work at. Yeah, um, you're, you're steamrolling our ob obstacles yeah. for yeah. For, uh, for entrepreneurs. Finding what all the obstacles are, yeah. and then getting rid of as many as you can. Yes, uh, and that's sort of my, uh, what I was saying with this. Without doing, doing bailouts and stuff, yeah. every <laughs> single person who wants to then start their own business and become an entrepreneur, so your chance of success is now suddenly multiplied. So let's say if one percent in that succeed, that's huge. If you know, if you've got a thousand, a thousand people doing that, mm. you know, that's okay. Then you've got 10. ten people. Yes, but if you oh, now focus on one or two people, you still will have a 50% failure rate in that. Um, sure. So that was just my thought. No, I, I agree completely. And I think um, Clay Shirky put his finger on it when it comes to the sort of innovation that goes on, say, in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has, has economic woes, but they still have Google, Facebook, Twitter. And the reason they have that is because bandwidth is for nothing yes. there. Yeah. I mean, so you don't think about the cost of it. And that's his point, is that... You know, you re things get interesting in terms of innovation when you when you when there is a very low cost of failure. So you know, you think about the experience of walking into a casino. You know, you walk up to a blackjack table and it's a thousand rand a bet. You know, you bet lose. The lesson you learn is don't bet. never do that again. <laughs> That's my lesson. The, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, but if it's, it's it's one or two rand, you think, okay, how does this game work? Let me keep playing until I figure it out. And that's that's how entrepreneurs work. They keep playing until they figure it out. But if it's too expensive to play, yeah, you know, if you're online, you know, enterprise, you're getting killed with SMS charges or. Uh, um, uh, or trying to you know pay license fees, then then you're not going to try again. I agree with that, yeah. And um, and sort of what I wanted to touch on there, and I know it's probably pop pop culture stuff, but um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, set up his first stuff right from his dorm room, um, and. I I'm not entirely sure that we can, you know, that, that all our universities really have that stuff available. Where yeah. you, can, you can put up a, you know, you, you learn. So you get yourself a cheap box, you put it on their network, you get a static IP address, um, and, you, um, and you, you know, host your own web service right from there. Um, and that's how, that's how you can, you know, get stuff started cheaply, quickly, see what works, what doesn't. Um, now, an interesting comment from IRC um, is... Uh, it, it's pretty blunt, so I'm just going to read it out as is. The goal of broadband internet for all is pointless without computer literacy, computer equipment, and a knowledge of the technology of the internet amongst all those people we're trying to give broadband to. So um, th that's maybe, um, you know, where, where government intervention, I, I use the word very, very carefully there. Um, in <laughs> intervention is always tricky because th that it tends to be a very inefficient way of doing things. Um, but where... You know, something needs to be done in order to to get that kind of knowledge and skills to people. I think. I mean, I, I think that's that's a very valid point. But but I think you also have to examine the, um, uh, the, the there's a kind of potential energy uh, of of when you make technology available. So you know, before the undersea cables uh, you know started landing uh, on the on the coast of Africa, 
there was no terrestrial fiber infrastructure to speak of. You know, very, very little. And what, what, what was there wasn't being used, because where, where are you building a bridge to? You're building a bridge to nowhere. But, um, but since um, the, the, uh, since CECOM landed, now I would say, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something I'm, I'm, I'm researching right at the moment, is uh, terrestrial fiber infrastructure in Africa. I don't know of a single country that does not have a national fiber project. And in most cases, multiple national fiber projects. So once, once that potential exists, once you have something to connect to, then suddenly it's, it's, like, it's like dominoes, right? More things start happening. So um, you know, uh, you know, once, once you have a reason to be connected, then you have a reason to learn you know, Why? how, you know, and once it's cheap enough. So well, I mean, I, I agree, it's complex, and it, it's an ecology of things that need to happen. But at the same time, we're at this tipping point where, where now we have the potential to make things you, happen. You, you need roads before people wanting to buy cars. Yeah. yeah. Fair um, enough. One thing, uh, that's one thing just where you mentioned from your website. Uh, you have very cool maps on there mm. of all the fiber stuff. So. Uh, so what is your website uh, again? Manypossibilities.net. Go there, just check out because you've got all the, the fiber maps for Africa and all the rest. I know you're busy looking now into, I think, doing the terrestrial one as yeah, well. Yeah, uh, with a little bit of support from Google, uh, building a terrestrial fiber map of Africa. So that'll be very Neat. cool. And um, there's there's more than that. Um, you also have a spectrum. Uh, a spectrum chart on there and that's quite neat as well uh, because that is uh, quite a, like an interactive thingy and it doesn't use flash it's just javascript <laughs> <laughs> thank you antoine van gelder <laughs> <laughs> cool well i thought it was awesome um and into from that topic i think it's it's easy enough to talk about mweb's problems today um yes be because um uh, what's happening at mweb i think is a a direct result of broadband becoming cheaper in south africa so all of a sudden it's becoming cheaper for us to host our content locally um before never mind cheaper possible um, because hosting a TV show on the internet um, is an expensive endeavor. Um, when when, when you're bandwidth for a gig, yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and and when you know you get like say uh, you know a, a thousand a thousand you know a hundred gigs or ten gigs or whatever it was in the beginning before they you know the, the and we gave us uncapped. Well, look before they did the uncapped ADSL, there was no ways we could stream this live. You, you just if you. Th thought of the cost it would, would have been ridiculous mm. and then never mind that is after that you now need to upload the videos and then no one would want to download them because you're talking large files it's 400 500 makes for the high quality file they look it's a lot smaller it goes down to so there were some audio podcasts and stuff so that but that's only 20 megs but you couldn't then compete against anybody and start to try work and innovate and and try and get it up to a decent quality that um where people would start looking at local contents instead of going overseas yes without the uncapped bandwidth. Yes. So, um, w that was, is a long story for we host with MWeb now yes. as, a, as a test for hosting South African content in South Africa. And unfortunately, this morning, uh, MWeb, yeah, MWeb, MWeb, MWeb had a big prang, like we mentioned um, uh, earlier in the show. So, the, the, um, it sounded like a core switch went down. And, um, and they lost email and they lost... Uh, and they lost hosting. So uh, I don't know if, th if everybody in their hosting in their DC was out. I th uh, from a guess, it was, I think, more the Johannesburg hosting went Johannesburg down. hosting, okay. Um, and I do get that some of the ADSL users had problems. Okay. If the ADSL users could connect, they just couldn't get DNS, which I imagine they had their own server hosted inside the, the hosting center. Sure, sure. All right, so now my question here, because we've already covered the topic quite extensively, is um, MWeb is not the first hosting company to report problems this year with the switch failing. So if the switches fail so often, um, uh, and, and, uh, and it's a genuine question, is it, is it easy to implement something that, that can, you know, uh, as like a hot standby? Uh, it all depends what the fault is. <laughs> now with this thing, it could actually be not the switch that broke, it could be a configuration that got loaded that then spawn started you know you we've had it we you, you start accidentally advertising incorrect routes yeah. or and then that config gets propagated throughout your whole network. network and then it takes you a while to actually undo that so you know it could be something like that we don't actually know what, what mm. was wrong um my other theory with this is until now we haven't been able to, to have people like and we're starting to do their own hosting all the rest of it so now as the bandwidth's gone cheaper and, and this is becoming available we have more people learning how to do this and it's quite a young technology and, and young things going on. You know, it's a new thing for South Africa. We're overseas, they've been doing it for Yonks. years. Mm. So initially in the beginning, when things were more prone to they must we went through all these 
teething problems, sorted out all the problems, and now are absolutely rock solid. So I wonder if that's also part of what's going on here as we're starting to, well, now we have it, so we're starting to work mm. it out. And now we've got go. critical stuff that's being hosted. It, it needs to go up. Um, yeah. If my broadband goes down, it hurts us badly. I don't think people understand how badly it hurts us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the stuff needs to stay up. When, when you open that door. Are you hosting with MWeb? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will step right through it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was checking my broadband to find out what was going on. <laughs> But yeah, I must say, <laughs> we've started with dumb. Yeah. yeah. So no, we we are actually in the MTN Business Data Center, though we don't host with MTN Business directly, uh, but a lot of folks use their DC. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, that's an interesting point. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, what happens going forward. All right. Yeah. Look, we're going to stay with them. It's still I want to have locally hosted. I'm it's proud one of the things I actually want to do. It's not uh, just because of the pricing, and it's it's also good. They. They offer a good service. Yeah, no, they offer a good service. What happened this morning is really the exception. I mean, yeah. Yeah. and there's... The on timing my was um, just unfortunate. On my broadband, there is a, a, a now response. I'm going to make some more plans for my broadband <laughs> conference. So just in case, we'll be able to roll over and switch over very quickly. And, you know, I, I, there will be a <laughs> failover. Um, but having said that, we're still going to stay there. I want to. I want to stay there. Well, Rudy will be right there, though. So if something goes wrong, you can just go walk up to him, give him a bottom clap. <laughs> you, you have that competition. What's it? <laughs> for, for, yes, <laughs> for, for Mampara of the Year award. Yeah. Yeah. Those votes already in. So oh, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> about that. I'm thinking at my ball when <laughs> it does. <laughs> Um, all right, just to quickly go through the last bits. Uh, Google Plus APIs. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, Google Plus. Also opened up to the public, yes. and then they, they launched the APIs. They, they now extended the APIs. <laughs> <laughs> so what were they in before? Closed beta, alpha. Oh my giddy aunt! I think alpha or something like that. But then now beta, which for them is live. That's right. Yes. And what I'm waiting for is a uh, is, yeah, tweet deck integration. So yeah, that's, uh, that's I use tweet deck. I like Google Plus, and the they don't go together. The problem yeah. is that tweet tweaks have now been bought over by Twitter. Yeah, so and that they're very question. bad at, at doing that. So I would like that, but I haven't seen an update well, for Tweet Deck. They, su they support Facebook. Yeah, but they used to support Facebook. Have you seen any updates to Twitter since uh, Tweet Deck since they've been bought by Twitter? I wonder what they're doing if they're not doing so a total rewrite. That would make me sad. I, I don't know. That's that's the thing is I am a Tweet Deck fan as well. It's what I mainly use, and I and I'm hoping at some point the updates are going to yeah. start coming rolling out again. I think they can't. Uh, I mean, they they can't ignore Google Plus. Mm. Yeah. Agreed, and and I hope they don't. Um, it'll be short sighted. So um, so yeah, we've got uh, APIs yeah. in Google Plus. We've had games in there for a while, but now they've apparently extended the API into Hangouts. I don't know if you've seen that. So what you can do in Hangouts right now is you can collaboratively watch videos. Um, I've not really thought of a use case for that, but it's kind of cool. You can load YouTube videos in. You could do that before. Yes, but now there's an API. So imagine Vimeo or yes. Daily Motion yeah. uh, or, or Let's Sierra. Talk Network. Indeed, yes. uh, but we're hosted on YouTube, so uh, so we can't. We are, we're already sort of able to be pulled in. Yeah, there. But you might be able to watch the live stream. Okay, yeah. but we will. Re yeah, I, I guess. Uh, don't worry. It's <laughs> so, so the guys are using RSC, but, but we'll, we'll play. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, but um, so yeah. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see what what they do. Uh, I was just going to say, I think there is something to simultaneity. And I think that's why TV is still is mm. still growing as an industry is because people want to watch an episode of something together. Yes. It's the zeitgeist of seeing the latest, uh, you know, um, you know, episode of Mad Men or whatever. Yeah. To be able to talk about it and, and yeah. get behind yeah. all the things. Yeah. And and I must say that that is something that I've also given some thought to because we've uh, we sort of ended up in a uh, or not ended up we're in a place where there's a lot of talk about on demand and you know stuff I'm gonna you know download the stuff that I want to watch now and watch it. Um, you know, with a lot of folks, you know, just, you know, downloading the latest uh, shows, whether legally or illegally. Um, and, but there is something to be said for, you know, coming into the office or, or to school the next day and standing around talking about, you know, the movie that you, s the Sunday night movie. Or but there will always be something like that, is, is my theory. It might just migrate and it'll be like, did you see this, what X said on, on Twitter or or there will always be something. Okay. There might not be movies or, and TV going forward, but th you'll get groups that we, who will watch show X, but there will always be something. Cool. We, we, we tend to, as, as humans, <laughs> congregate yeah. around things. Yeah. And the other thing that Google launched uh, in the last week is their wallet. Um, and I was in San Francisco just before this happened. I saw the signs in Pete's Coffee, my new favorite coffee shop. Okay. 
And I the didn't fires, think... There's fires, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I didn't think about it twice. Like, I didn't, I didn't really... I'm like, oh, yeah, Google Wallet. I heard about that. And, uh, and yeah, and all the, the, I didn't really click. Oh, hang on. Google has rolled out readers uh, to merchants and that must be a sign. Yes. Um, so, yeah, anyway, for all the lucky people in San Francisco who, <laughs> who buy their coffee from Pete, they can and now walk up. And have an Nexus S. And have uh, an NFC yeah. phone from Sprint. <laughs> it's only the Sprint Nexus S, uh, apparently, that's getting the update right now. But look, hopefully that will then come out to all the, well, and hopefully all the new phones eventually come out with the near field communication. Yeah. Um, Th this I would Do you think that's going to rush to take off here? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wish you would. Cause I'm, I want my, my wallet. I want all those cards yeah, yeah. to become my phone. Yeah. Um, and I think you always need money in this country for a very long period of time. Um, but I can still having the wallet only holding money and maybe one or two cards and then everything else off your phone that you swap because I, it yeah. will make my life so much easier. There, there was, I don't know if we covered this topic before, but there was an NFC trial um, that happened at Opikopi this year. I don't know if you guys heard about that. So basically... Um, you, um, the, no cash was accepted at Opikopi. The only way you could spend oh, cash was to load yeah. it on, on your yeah. NFC card. We did discuss it on one of the other shows called LT Afrikaans. Okay, cool. Yeah. Plug it. Plug it, bro. Yes. Oh, uh, normally on yeah, Thursday if nights. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you thought Google knew, knew too much about you already. <laughs> well, let's <laughs> say, they really know too much. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I don't think it would, it would hurt that much more. Uh, look, I already have a credit card registered in Google Checkout so that I can buy apps on the market. So well, I was also just thinking, you, you know, when you buy things and you you get, I don't know if you guys get the email saying, by the way, your credit card has been used here. Well, that goes into Gmail. So they must really have that information. Yeah, but they don't, I mean, so there's, there's, yes. there's, there's, yes, there's I tracking know, there's and then there's tracking. tracking. But uh, Fair enough. you guys are scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> you should be more wary of that. You're, you're embracing our brave new future. Yeah, yeah no, uh, look, it's something that I worried about and then I became a journalist. Um, <laughs> and then I realized that <laughs> my face is all over the web for anybody to see. Uh, so, so much is public anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you share, um, it, just as a journalist, you share so much information with the rest of the people in the industry. So my bio is out there. People know a lot of my history. People know who I'm married to. Um, when I was just a just when I was uh, a, a, an actual contributing member of society as an engineer, um, you know th that that circle of people that had to know who I am was much smaller. So what the web has done is it's just made that for everybody. Now everybody can know who you are. You know, like you know, there's my about.me page. Um, have you have you seen the the Gmail plugin uh, called Reportive? No, I have not. Oh, man. If you want to be frightened, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very simple thing. It's a little panel in Gmail, and any email you get, it queries them on, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and, you know, like five other networks, even, uh, even GitHub, hmm. and, and gives you their entire profile. So complete, be, co I must have this. Complete strangers email you, you know more about them than you wanted to know, because some of them with their Facebook settings, I mean, it's just yeah. shocking. Are you, so it's like a portable CIA kit. Uh, Sweet. Truly. <laughs> Reportive. I must have it. We'll check that out. Thank you. Um, so almost uh, your kicker, and then sure. All right. So um, I bought these while I was in California because for this year only, uh, Amazon still ships to California without sales tax. So I don't know if you guys can see it I up in the camera. There we go. All right. So it's supposed to be for glare. It's indoor shades. So I don't know how I look on camera. But uh, it's, it, I think it's actually helped with my eye strain. I spend a lot of time in front of a PC, as you can imagine. And uh, I'd come home often with a headache. And uh, this has helped, actually, so far. It was like a virtual heads-up display. <laughs> 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 it's just the, it's just a it's yellow glasses. <laughs> it's just a gimmick. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a, instead of seeing what, what rose-tinted world, you've got a... Yeah, I've got an amber-tinted tinted world. There we go. And uh, what was a bit disappointing was, well, this was on special, so that's okay, but you don't get like a hard case or anything for them. And they, you know, they're, they're this shape that's very easy to bend and break and stuff. Um, but it, you know, it just came with this little pouchy thing, which is neat for cleaning it, but not so neat for shoving in your bag. Yeah. So it's an issue of ordering something else off Amazon. <laughs> I actually uh, walked into an optometrist here in South Africa, gave him ten rand, and he gave me a case. Cool. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, with that, we're going to end. Uh, I just want to thank, thank Steve once again for being on. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate mention it. your websites again and where people can hold of you? Uh, VillageTelco.org, uh, many pos- ManyPossibilities.net, and uh, Steve Song on Twitter. Cool. Uh, thanks, Jan, for joining us again. Uh, I am still right as your shirt proclaims. Um, Johan Aas for mixing. Always a pleasure. And uh, thanks for myself, Tim Hawk. Yep. Thank for you. For hosting. Yeah. You rock. Cheers. 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 Cheers.